Amen. In our studies, we've been talking about how we read. And which Bible verse did we go to yesterday to discuss that? Good. The book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 26. We won't read. We know it's about the Good Samaritan. And the lawyer asks the question, how to receive eternal life? Jesus answers. He says, if you're willing and able to see it, you receive eternal life by obeying and following the law. The soul that sinneth shall die. Therefore, the soul that does not sin will live. The Bible speaks about those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The Bible speaks about <clears throat> those who keep the law have a right to enter into heaven. <clears throat> But there's a problem. And what is that problem? It says in verse 26. How you read. So you know that people are reading the law incorrectly. In fact, if you look at the four Gospels, essentially all you see is a fight. If I can say it in this framework, it's a fight between Laodicea and Ephesus. We could say between Caiaphas, the leader, and Jesus the leader. In the early part of Ephesus, it would be Caiaphas against John. So there's this struggle between these two movements. These two churches. And it's based upon how you interpret and understand the law. And the problem is, the reason why the church has entered into a latency and condition is not just about how they understand those Ten Commandments. Although, as Sister Terry is going through her presentations, you see that the Sabbath is not just about a 24-hour period where you don't work. And that's the problem with just reading Exodus 20. It doesn't explain very well the intent and purpose of the Sabbath. So, when Jesus says, how do you read? We've already discussed, it's not just Exodus 20 that he's referring to. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's how you read the Old Testament scriptures. And we, and we know that the church laid a series reading incorrectly. So we believe in line upon line. So we should expect 
that the history of ancient Israel at the, at, at the end should mirror the experience of modern Israel, God's church, here at the end of the world. And that's what we're experiencing today. It's all about how you read inspiration. The reason why it's become controversial at the moment is because we're not fighting against the conference structure anymore. The struggle is an internal one in this movement. We have our question and answers in the afternoon. And I know many of us are not coming to those, um, that session because, of, because we have other activities to do. But some important issues are being addressed in those studies. And I think they're important issues that we should all be understanding here. So if you're not coming to those question and answers, you're going to miss out on the questions and the answers for a few weeks before they get uploaded. It's Wednesday. It's our third question and answer today. So I really want to encourage people um, if they can attend. Because an important question was asked yesterday about some of these issues. <coughs> One of the problems that people have at the moment is that we're no longer reading inspiration. We're too political. We talk too much about politics. And it's all theoretical about lines. We're no longer reading inspiration. So, the problem with those kind of accusations, which are false, by the way, and they're false, is the following. I would expect each of us to have read Daniel 11, verse 40. I would have expected us I would have expected us to understand the basic reform lines. Time of the end, increase of knowledge, formalization. The empowerment, the shut door. All of those studies were completely based upon inspiration. Now, if we were to go back and prove those things using inspiration, our studies would never progress. So, we are assuming that each of us know a basic reform line. If you don't, then it all sounds like logic. It sounds like we're not talking about things that are from inspiration, we're just making them up. And 
9.1. So, I've just spoken about a reform line. Increase of knowledge. Preceded by the time of the end. Formalization. Empowerment. Shut door. And today we would go further than the shut door. So a basic study like this has all been created from inspiration. And we've been teaching this in a proper fashion for about four years now, perhaps five. So, priests, Levites, and Nethanims. Once again, all of those studies have been done. Whether you go to the book of Ezra, whether you go to Second Chronicles chapter 29, chapter 30, whether you go to the Gospels and see Jesus' ministry, whether you go to Luke chapter 10, all of these studies have demonstrated the truthfulness that there's three groups. And that's in addition to all the spirit of prophecy quotes that we've used. So, in the time period in which we live, if we want to advance our studies, there has to be a level of maturity which means we have to take those studies and we have to use them and apply them today. So another one that we've spent a lot of time addressing is the agricultural model. Whether you go to the book of Zechariah, the book of Matthew, or the book of Mark, or Jeremiah, all of these books, all of these stories teach you about an agricultural model. And again, I'm assuming they're all familiar with this. That there's a ploughing, a former rain, latter rain, and harvest. We know this is based upon inspiration. Because if you went to Revelation 14, often we stop at verse 12. But if you go to the end of the chapter, it talks about Jesus and another angel having sharp sickles. It's identified on these, it's on these charts, but I know you can't see it because it's quite low. If you could hold it here. Yeah. You can see that Jesus has a sickle. And the second angel has a sickle. And both of these people are going to be doing a different work. But they're both going to be doing a harvest. <coughs> a harvest of the good and a harvest of the bad. So, these ideas, 
that we speak about today, whether it's the wheat and the tears, Matthew chapter 13, or these two harvests of, harvest of Revelation 14, they're all based upon inspiration. We would spend hours if we proof text everything that we draw. So that's why we don't refer to inspiration every time we make a point. <coughs> because what we're doing in this movement is not sermons. These are studies. And what people often don't appreciate is that at a camp meeting like this, where I have maybe seven or eight presentations, that I can't develop the whole message in 10 hours. So you're required to watch presentations before and afterwards. Most of us realize that we're in this history, the history of the harvest for the priests. If you don't know that, I'm just stating that as a fact. We're here at the very beginning. Now, do you think if you're at the very beginning, you know everything about this history? Of course not. We can't know all the details of what's about to happen. It's going to require more study. It's going to require the Holy Spirit teaching us. As the information is unsealed. So if you think about that, this is... Depending on how you calculate, this is the first series of presentations that I've done in this dispensation. From November the 10th onward. So, whatever we discuss here, we're not going to know everything. So you're required to watch the presentations that will come at the end of this month, into January, February and through the year. If you don't do that, you will not be able to understand what we're speaking about. So some of us have come here with very little background information. Maybe you're new. Maybe you haven't been studying. Whatever the reason, You have to be understanding that we can't go back to these um, original studies to prove them here. We can just review them um, at a very basic level. The Bible speaks about things old and things new. Now, 
I want to remind us and people manipulate and misunderstand what I say quite often. If you go to the history of Christ, if we were to ask what is the Bible, how many books would there be? No, it wouldn't be 66. Because in the time of Christ, the New Testament does not exist. So it'd only be 39 books. So imagine, not only what Paul is saying, but what even Christ or John or any of the disciples are teaching. Everything that they're teaching, they're not using a thus saith the Lord. They're seeing history and prophecy being fulfilled. And they're commenting on it. They're making observation. Often they quote from the Old Testament. And when they quote from the Old Testament, how do you think they do that? Do you think they go from literal to literal? They don't. Yesterday we spoke about a plain, thus saith the Lord. They don't do that. Because there's very little information. There's no inspiration to base, to base what's happening at that moment. Give you an example. In, in the Old Testament, when Aaron and his family is made the priesthood, and then the wider tribe of Levi, what does Moses say about that? In fact, what does God say in Moses' writes? He says there will be a priesthood for how long? <coughs> hundred years? Two hundred years? Forever. Thank you. It says forever. Go check. It says that. So if you've got a thus saith the Lord that says we're going to have a priesthood forever. What do you do with that? We've already begun to understand what kind of a priesthood that is. Now often we don't talk about it in this context. We say before the Levitical priesthood, there was the patriarchal priesthood. The patriarchal priesthood was based upon um, men being the priest of their household. It changed. It changed from the firstborn to the tribe of Levi. Do we all know that? There was a change in the priesthood. 
When did that change happen? What event? It wasn't a Jacob. It was after the Red Sea. Before Jordan. What's the event? It's the golden calf. So because of the sin that Israel does, they get the priesthood taken away from them. And it's given to the tribe of Levi. So there's a change that occurs. All of that is in inspiration. You come to the New Testament. That means the history of Christ. Is there any inspiration then written? There isn't. All they've got is the Old Testament. So Paul, he's going to write a book called the book of Hebrews. Is this it becomes difficult today because you're all going to say yes. Is this inspiration? Is this an inspired document? When Paul writes it, is it a thus saith the Lord? It's not considered a thus saith the Lord. The church would never accept it as an inspired document. Laodicea in church would not. And many people didn't like Paul. All he's doing, he's travelling, writing all these letters, and people don't have a cognition, they don't have a sense that he is creating the New Testament. It's just to, like today. A teacher travels the world, does all these presentations. Do you think that's an inspired, um, I call it a document, it's video. Do you think these videos are inspired? I don't mean that they're led by God, I mean inspired. This, would, this is God's word, this is God's video. None of you think that way. If we went 500 years in the future, a group of people might come together and say, we collect all those videos And that is, I call it the word of God, but the video of God. Isn't that what we've done with Ellen White's writings? They had the Bible. She writes all of these documents. They get all put together. And today, when we look back, we say they're equal to the Bible. In her life, some people accepted her word and some people didn't. So in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, what is Paul going to say? So whenever I say Hebrews chapter 7, someone's, oh, we're all turning our Bibles there. And I want to say, we should already know what that chapter says. We should already have a good understanding of that chapter so I could just tell you what it says. And then you say, yep, let's move on. But, but you're all turning there, so you expect me to tell you the verse. 
<laughs> so now I'm going to have to find the verse and read it to you. <laughs> so we'll do that then. It just slows us down. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 7 verse 12. As you're turning there, if you like numbers, it's nice that it's the number 7 and the number 12. Number 7 is an oath, perfection. Number 12, symbol of Israel. We'll read. So the verse says there must be a change of the law. So that's not the Ten Commandments. It's some Old Testament law that said what? What word did it say? Forever. And thus saith the Lord said, forever. Paul is going to write a letter to someone and he's going to say, we're going to change the word of God. And whatever Moses said is no longer valid. I want you to really think about that. What would you do if you were this person who receives a letter, you may not even have met Paul. He's got a bad reputation. The conference hate him. He's been disfellowshipped. He killed Christians. Many of the Christians don't like him because he's too radical. Doesn't listen to anybody. Keeps on collecting disciples to himself. And then he says, whatever Moses said, I'm going to change. What would you do? How many of you in the movement would accept that? So I want you to think about this in a really serious fashion. Because that's what we're confronted with today. I'm not a prophet. What I say is not an inspired statement. So when I say, Alan White said this thing. So Alan White said this thing. What am I going to do? I'm going to say, ignore it now. We'll change what she said. It's the same thing. And we don't appreciate that, I think, because of what I said yesterday. Because Paul is so far away, he's become a holy man. The closer you get to him, the worse he looks. Looks like a rebel doing crazy things. The leadership of the movement don't even respect him. He has to fight to explain his authority. Everyone accepts the 11. And they don't like Paul. So I want us to be clear of what we're seeing here. You have inspiration. 
said forever. And Paul says, forever doesn't mean forever. It means for a certain time period. If I were to do that today, people complain. When he says what God meant, he never meant forever. He meant until. Not forever. Until. That's what he meant. You can be priests until the times of refreshing shall come. Show me a dust after the Lord where this will work. It's not there. There's no clear Old Testament passages that do this. The Jews have so many misunderstandings of how to understand inspiration. What I'm trying to get us to do is to see how painful this is. And when you read Hebrew 7, you think this is great light. This is beautiful. 2,000 years ago, it was ugly. It was sin. It's rebellion against God to get rid of Caiaphas and to substitute him with someone. And Paul says this. What he's saying is, the General Conference President will get rid of him. And in fact, we got rid of him a long time ago. Because this wasn't, this wasn't written in 27 AD or 31 AD. It was written decades later. So think about this when we come to our own situation. Paul is a master. First of all, he says, forever doesn't mean forever. Then we go to the next chapter. Chapter 8. Verse 1. You read. So he says, I've given you seven chapters of evidence. It's the letter, of course. He says, all of that was the proof. Proof about what? Who Jesus is. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the summary. He's going to summarize everything that he said so far. We have a priest in heaven that you can't see. And he expects you to believe that. You think about that. He says, believe that there's a priest in heaven. And half the church don't even believe any of this stuff, by the way. The Sadducees don't believe in what? The resurrection. Don't believe in angels. I say half, I don't know what the percentage is. 
So first of all, he's going to infer that Jesus is resurrected, which people don't believe. Then he says the high priest here on earth has lost his job. And we think this is great light. Except when we start saying the same thing today. We'll drop down a few verses. Verse 10. From verse 6 to verse 13, these are important passages that we should have a working knowledge about. All these verses have been explained in various presentations at least this year. Verse 10. Mm -hmm. So it says in verse 10, <coughs> what we're seeing today, <coughs> what we're seeing today, <coughs> the priesthood's broken, We have a new priest from a wrong tribe. There's no evidence that that should happen. You can't see this priest, he's in heaven. All of this, he calls it the covenant. This is the covenant that I'm going to make with you. After those days, put my laws in their mind and I'll write them in their hearts. So, he doesn't tell you here. He's copying. This is not Paul's writings. I know some of us know who is he quoting? Who is this? It's not Moses, no. This is Jeremiah. Chapter? Good. Is, he just takes Jeremiah's writing and he quotes it. Today we were called that. Taking something out of context. What days is Paul talking about here? It says after those days. Paul. He says after the days. What days is he speaking about? What one is Paul talking about? So someone gave me the answer at the back. We'll say Daniel chapter 9. 490. Or 70 weeks. That's what is in Paul's mind. But Jeremiah, he says after those days, my sister, what's Jeremiah talking about? Jeremiah. You told me before. Someone else. He's talking about Babylon. 70 years. Remember, when we look at inspiration, we have to consider what? Context and history. Who's Jeremiah speaking to? 
I'll give you three choices. The people alive. Paul. Or us. Who's he speaking to? Okay, so someone says everybody. I guess that's the technically correct answer. But he's speaking to the people who are alive today. Name the three kings. Jehoiakim, Chin, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah. I tricked you because there's more than three kings. When did he begin his ministry? Not Manasseh. We won't answer. Have a look in Jeremiah chapter 1. It gives you the answer when he begins his ministry. You don't have to do that now. So, he's going to speak about 70 years. And Paul is going to speak about 70 weeks of years or 490 years. And what are we going to do? My sister told us we're going to make it 1260. After those days. Which, so I'll say Christians. They're going to say after those days. We'll just go with the chapter and the book. Someone else. I want, the, I want the book in the chapter, not the prophecy. When he talks about us, we say after those days, something's going to happen. The covenant's going to be restored. Not Revelation, not Daniel. I'll give you a clue. I'll give you a clue. Jeremiah says, after captivity. So, these days are captivity. Paul says, after captivity. So we say, after captivity. I want the book. Matthew. 24. You go there, it says, after those days, what's going to happen? Christ is going to come, the people are going to be restored. So, we take these Bible phrases and we apply them. Paul does that all of the time. Does he have a choice? Why does he not have a choice? Because when he's alive, he's here. This is Paul. Where is inspiration? Before. Good, it's over here. This is the Bible, and there's hundreds of years between the Bible and him. The last book of the Bible is what? Get the right answer. Good. Good. It's Malachi. Maybe three or four hundred years. Moses. Maybe a thousand years. So he has to take these words and make them fit today. Now, if we'll call this the reform line of Christ. 
in the reform line of Christ, if you have to do this, when we go to the reform line of whom? The Millerites. The Bible here is the Old Testament. What's their relationship to inspiration? The same or different? It's the same. How many years? I'll put 2,000 years. It's 1,800. And here's the Bible. And the Bible is now what? 66 books now. So every line that we're dealing with here we could go back even into the line of Moses if we wanted to. If we were to do that we'd have Moses' his own word. That would be a dust saith the Lord. It's a lot smaller. So, when we come to our line, the line of the 144,000, why are we making it different? What do Adventists do? The Bible is here. That's, we all agree on that. But what do Adventists do? Bible's five. What else do we have now? Spirit of prophecy. Where do we put spirit of prophecy? Where do we put it normally? Next to it. We put it here. It's not the same pattern. Where should the spirit of prophecy go? Back. Good. Should go here. <coughs> and the reason we don't, because it's so short. And Ellen White talks emphatically with strength <coughs> that Jesus is going to come in her day. <coughs> because she's going to take this model here. After 1798, Christ is going to come back for definite. But he didn't. He didn't come back in the 60s, 1860s. He didn't come back in the late 19th century. We call it the 1888 history. And the white died. All of those generations died. Those people. And we're a new generation now. So why do we approach her writings differently? Because we're not reading correctly. People would see what I'm saying as an insult to God. Or a rejection of his word. What I think is happening is we're now having a clearer understanding of our relationship to inspiration. And we're confronted with the same issues that Paul was confronted with here. He has to take statements from Jeremiah and make them applicable to his history. 
Okay, apply to the choir when I'm not in Salonor. And I want to pull it with And to do that, either things have to change, or he has to make an application. Now, we're in, a, we're in a climate at the moment, a situation, the church thinks we're crazy, of course. We know that. But now those people who used to walk with us, they say we're not following a thus saith the Lord. And they've targeted one specific issue. What's that? Sunday law. That's the one that they want to focus on. Future for America have proven they say they have proven that we are leading you astray we're agents of Satan and what's their proof? That we are taking inspired statements and changing them. <clears throat> Alan White says, there will be a Sabbath Sunday, a Saturday Sunday fight. <clears throat> in the United States and in every country afterwards. And we're saying it's not going to look like the standard Adventist model. That you can't just do a thus saith the Lord. Doesn't work like that. They're saying you must be a satanic movement then because you no longer follow God's word. But the thing is we're being open and upfront about what we say, what we teach. So, if you want to follow a thus saith the Lord, you tell me when you stop doing that. Seven years ago, this movement began to teach that we have time we can calculate time when things are going to happen. We call that time setting. And guess what the argument was? By the same people who are fighting us today. Future for America. Seven years ago their argument was No time setting. Why did they say no time setting? Because it's a thus saith the Lord. So that was their evidence. They were consistent. Thus saith the Lord all the way through. They were, they were not really consistent, by the way. But we'll just take this example. Last year, suddenly, they changed their position. Seven years ago, they say, thus saith the Lord. One year ago, they say, no, thus saith the Lord. They say, we agree with you. There's about, there's over 20 pages of Spirit of Prophecy quotes. 
all say no time setting. So they take all of those statements and they throw them away and they say we agree. We can time set. When they say we agree, who are Future for America agreeing with? They were agreeing with this movement. Took them six years to come to an agreement with us. So today, they agree with time setting. And if you follow their presentations, if you have any sympathy with their position, go on your computer, find all the quotes that say no time setting, send it to them, and ask them why they're not following the Thus saith the Lord. Ask what their logic is. Because I've, I've been clear about what our logic is. I'm with Paul. I'm using the same logic that he did. When God said what forever, he meant until. He said, there will be priests for this dispensation. Afterwards, it finishes, it ends. <clears throat> it's the idea of dispensations that help to explain what's going on. I want to remind us that these 70 weeks here, we can give it a title. This time period has a title to it. It's the time of... Maybe the question is too difficult. It's the time of scattering. Four hundred ninety years is part of the twenty three hundred years. It's part of the twenty five twenty. We know it's the scattering because when Jesus comes after those days. What is the church expecting? Deliverance. Deliverance means end of end of captivity, end of scattering. Good. So it's the days of captivity or the days of scattering? The days of captivity or the days of scattering? It's the same thing. So, when it says, after those days, what begins? It's the reform line of Christ. So, the reform line of Christ is now going to be dealt with. We call that what? The gathering. So, when you come to the gathering... There's different rules, different laws than the scattering. So let's summarize. In the scattering, there's one rule. In the gathering, there's another rule. 
There has to be a change. If there wasn't a change, what would happen? There'd be no gathering, there'd be no change. Good. What spirit prophecy quote am I referring to? Which book? Early writings, good. What page? Good. Early writings, page 74. If God does not change the rules for scattering, you will not have a gathering. There is of necessity a change in the law. Where do we read that? Hebrews 7 verse 12. Good. Hebrews 7 verse 12. Think of an oath or a promise and think of Israel. If you don't change, you cannot have the fulfillment of the new covenant. So this is the proof or the logic that I use, that this movement uses, to take these quotes, and when you go from a scattering to gathering to change them, She says no. And today it's yes. Did she say sometime in the future it will change? No. Who said it changes? We do. Or in this story it's Paul. So we're following the same principle as Paul did. We're in Paul's position. He's a member of Ephesus. We're a member of Ephesus. Many, many parallels. Especially when you look at um, Acts chapter 27. It comes really clear how his life and our life parallel one another. So when people start saying on what license do you change a Sunday law to I'll use the word equality but I think a better word is restoration. The test is about restoring things. Restoring them to their proper place. The license for us to do that is the same logic that this movement has used since its very beginning. You have to follow a thus day of the Lord and make applications. Chapter 11, verse 40. What did the Lord say? How many? Read the verse. Go ask someone who's not in this movement and ask them the question. At the time of the end, singular, definite article. Time of the end, only one of them. 
God will tell you when that happened. In inspiration. 1798. Where did this movement ever get the idea that it's 1989? They didn't get it from a thus saith the Lord. I agree God inspired us. But it's not thus saith the Lord. I believe God inspired Paul. But it's not thus saith the Lord that he's doing. Same verse. 9-11. Where do you get 9-11 from? There's no spirit of prophecy quote that talks about 9-11. Not a single one. The people who say that there are, go test Mr. Church, volume 9, beginning page 11. You go Review and Herald. July 5th, 1906. Some people refer to it as Life Sketches 411. Same passage. Read them carefully. Watch the studies that have been done this year on those uh, passages and it's clear to see that it's not 9-11. There's no thus saith the Lord for 9-11. Is 9-11 correct? Yes. What we teach is the truth. But we didn't get it from a thus saith the Lord. And I want to say it in strong language. It's a lie to say that we did. You can go to Revelation chapter 9 verse 11. His name is Abaddon and Apollyon. Apollyon. Death and destruction. You can say, see, there's your proof. That is not a thus saith the Lord. You might like it. You might believe it. I would defend it. But I would not call it a thus saith the Lord. The definition of a thus saith the Lord is a plain reading. Someone who doesn't agree with you, they could read the same thing that you did and agree with you. So, we have a history of not following a thus saith the Lord. Another one, verse 40. Evangelism. We're told not to do evangelism. You go to Matthew 10, what does Jesus say? No evangelism. Matthew 28 says, Go out and do evangelism till when? Till Christ comes. Does Ellen White agree? Yes. After 1850. Before she didn't. And then we say no evangelism. So thus saith the Lord's for that. We have to be honest. 
We have to follow rules. We have to be consistent. And for too long, many of us have not been that. And you must not be confused by people calling their former brethren names. By making you scared. Don't follow this person because he worships Satan. Or uh, this other person is a Jesuit. Or this other person has got a mental condition. Or this other person is a homosexual. These are not good reasons. We need to follow rules and principles. Otherwise, according to rule number five, And rule number 14, you become a bigot. And a bigot is someone who's a puppet. You just do what you're told. You copy people. You mustn't copy people. You have to think for yourselves. Which means when people give false arguments, you must see through them. The one that is currently a controversy is that the Sunday law that's written in the spirit of prophecy the way it's written is not going to be fulfilled in that exact, literal way. Let me ask you a question. The dragon, the beast and the false prophet. What's the dragon power? Today, what? If I were to ask you, who's the dragon power today? Who's the beast? Who's the false prophet? And the dragon? So, this model here, who, where did you get that from? Who taught you that? Daniel talks about the UN? Spirit Prophecy talks about the UN? Spirit Prophecy talks about spiritualism, Protestantism and Catholicism. History? So, you can go to kings. Testimonies to ministers. Page 38, paragraph 1. Kings, rulers and governors have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist. which is the papacy, and are represented as the dragon power. That's the best we've got. And that means the dragon power is the kings in what history? Is Herod the dragon? Is Ahab the dragon? 
So the dragon power goes a long way back. How did you get from there to the UN? All I want to say, this is not a thus saith the Lord. We've constructed this. It's based upon logic. But it's not a thus saith the Lord. Most of what you believe, you think is a thus saith the Lord until you're required to go and find out. And I don't say any of this to hurt your faith. All of these are correct. They're all correct. But they need to be explained. We need to use line upon line. I'll just say we need to use rules to develop these truths. Now we're coming to the very end of our history. Why do you think it's going to change? Why do you think it's all going to become literal? Why do you think it's all going to become literal? Sunday law, Sunday law. It says kings. The dragon power has to be kings. So, I don't think you have a king in this country. So you can't be part of the dragon power. You begin to see how silly it is when you take things literally. So, none of this is taken literally. We use application based upon rules. We have to do the same with the Sunday law. Don't be deceived that we don't have all the answers. Where are we? We're right here at the beginning to understand what's going on. We already have good evidence in this history here. What way mark is that? That's the date. What way mark? Good. Don't get tricked. We've had five years of Sunday law. It's a lot of evidence. What way mark is this? No. No. Someone said? Universal? No. Raffia? So you're almost correct. I'm going to call it Sunday law. The reason it's not universal, the reason it's not universal, because we're still in verse 40. We're not in verse 41 yet. So, we're at the end of one Sunday law, and we're at the beginning of another Sunday law. So, I'm not going to explain this further because we've run out of time. But if people say, well, what does your Sunday law look like? Depends. We've got a lot of information here. But we've got very little information. So I would say, I know a lot. And I only know a little bit. The problem is, the things that I know a lot about, people are ignoring. 
Future for America are ignoring it. And the people who are listening to them are ignoring that too. So you make it very difficult for a teacher and for yourself to understand. But we're at the beginning of a Sunday law and God's going to teach us more about what this looks like. In our next class, I'll explain this a bit more. All I'll say for now is this is the Sunday law for the priests and this is the Sunday law for the Levites and there's more to follow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks. We ask, Lord, that you would guide and direct us this day, especially in the meditation and study of your word. Lord, we know that we are living in special times, in the time where you want to gather your people together. And yet we also live in a harvest, a time period where there is separation and there is a cutting away of things. Help each of us, Lord, wherever we are in our experience, to hear your voice speaking to us individually through your chosen messengers. We've asked already many times this week, but we will continue to ask, please be with us at this camp meeting. Help us to receive the blessing that you want to give to us so that we might leave this place refreshed and strengthened. Guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.